This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Yeah, look, that whole host thing, kind of blown out of proportion. Plain and simple, we're just two regular guys who like spending time with you and chatting about agriculture. Yes, all kinds of ag at that, including some of the topics you'll see today. Straight ahead, from the heart of Jasper, a summit tackling farm stress head on. Watch as we uncover the power of conversation and breaking down mental health barriers within the ag community. Ready or not, experts say gear up for a pecan revolution. Why Georgia's booming production and new market strategies are shaking up the industry. Plus, Dr. Tracy Brigman and yours truly are getting you ready for Vidalia onion season with tantalizing recipes using petite spring onions. Mouthwatering dishes you don't want to miss. All this and so much more starts right now. Well, the bottom line is this. Farming presents immense challenges with producers currently navigating some of the toughest times in decades. This underscores the significance of events like the Farm Stress Summit. The Monitor's John Holcomb gives us a closer look at this important gathering, shedding light on efforts to address farm-related stressors amid the increasing acceptance of mental health awareness. Recently in Jasper, the University of Georgia held its annual Farm Stress Summit, an event that's meant to shine a light on the stressors within the ag community and help strengthen the resources that are available. It's an event that has helped make major strides on the topic of mental health, especially within the farming community, as more and more people come forward to talk about their struggles and stress. One of the things we found is that in general, not just with the farming community, but also with um, any community, people are just more willing to talk about it. In the last five years, you've seen more people willing to come forward. Athletes on TV talk about their mental health. They make it, you know, social media um, has made it a lot more accessible for people to say, hey, I'm struggling, things are not okay. And I think a lot of people um, have personally been touched by suicide or by a mental illness, either in their family or in their community. And just talking about it, being willing to to talk about it there's still a, there's still some stigma but I think that we're just having more conversations people are a little more willing these days and I just see it increasing every day according to Christina Proctor a professor within UGA's College of Public Health that couldn't be truer as she says when conducting her research within the state farmers were very open about where they were and says most of the time she found that only takes one person to start the conversation one thing that really stuck out to me in all the interviews that we did was that our farmers actually really wanted to talk about their stress. They wanted to talk about the struggles that they had faced, and I think there is this shift. Um, and, you know, I had an interview with a farmer a few weeks ago, and she's like, it only takes one of us. One of us has to be brave enough in these meetings to step out and say, like, hey, like, I'm struggling, or I think we should talk about mental health. Um, and I think that that's you know, I think having a stress summit like this opens up those conversations even more because somebody in this room could go to one of those meetings and like, like feel like they could open up about it after they've seen other people up here being, you know, sharing their experiences or they've seen the data and the quotes from our farmers across the state. Dunn believes that events like this one help facilitate those meaningful conversations as more people realize the benefit of being open and discussing what they're going through and helps others know how to talk to those dealing with mental health challenges. One of the things I think that is the best, you know, advantage of this is you have the ag folks and the mental health folks in the same room and they get to know each other and they might, they might, you know, have kids that play on the same ball, um, you know, they might play baseball together, they might play soccer together, but they didn't know, oh, I didn't know you did that. I didn't know, you know, that's what you did for a job. And so how can we build on those partnerships and, and work with these folks together? One of the things we just talked about in our last session was mental health first aid or, um, Question, Persuade, and Refer, which are two programs that help you have a conversation with people about, you know, just this topic. How do you talk to people about depression? How do you talk to people about suicide prevention? And so just the best thing to me is just knowing who the partners are, who the players are, and how we can connect each other. Reporting in Jasper for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb.
Already the nation's leader in pecan production, Georgia is expected to see those numbers grow even more over the next few years as a record number of acres have now been planted. Damon Jones tells you what that means for the price and what growers can do to lower some of their input costs. There's a whole lot of shaking going on here in Georgia as it is responsible for nearly a third of the country's pecan production. And that is unlikely to change in the near future with a number of trees finally reaching maturation. Once the, when the prices went high back around 2010, we started having a lot of planting taking place. So our planting in Georgia, we've probably added since that time, probably 60,000 acres of pecans. Um, and now we're starting to see those plantings contribute to the volume that's out there. And so what used to be an off crop in Georgia or a bad crop in Georgia used to be about 40 million pounds of pecans in the state. Now an off year in Georgia is more like 80 to 85 million pounds. However, that record production could put downward pressure on the price growers will see, especially with a chief trading partner buying less of their product. Pecan growers normally make good money when there's a good, strong in-shell pecan market. And right now, we don't really have a good in-shell market. China was a, a tremendous in-shell market, and so that's why we saw the prices uh, go up so high and, and do so well for growers. Um, but with the tariffs that came on in 2018, um, that of course uh, cut, cut that out. That means new markets must be explored. And one option is the country with the second highest population. We had some buyers from India over here a few months ago, uh, meeting with pecan suppliers here in Georgia and throughout the US. And um, there was a lot of uh, demand, a lot of interest there. Um, the tariff reduction going from 100% down to 30%, I think is going to open the door. But until then, growers are going to have to do more with less, and the University of Georgia's breeding program is looking to make that job a little easier. Uh, long term, we need to get better varieties in those orchards that have a higher yield potential. So a lot of the older varieties that we were growing, that yield potential, you know, maximum consistently would be around thousand maybe 1200 pounds an acre we need varieties that are going to provide 1500 to 2000 pounds an acre or more um, and do that at a lower cost of production with that in mind there is one thing growers are encouraged to do in order to get the most out of their trees one thing that that has become very popular in the last few years that we see a lot of positive benefits to is hedge pruning um, so you basically, with hedge pruning, you go down the length of the tree row and cut everything off a certain distance away from the trunk and then you top that tree to bring the size of the tree down. And what that does, um, it allows you to bring that entire tree uh, into a size that whatever sprayer you're using can cover that crop. Reporting from Tift County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, are you looking for a unique recipe for dinner tonight? How's this sound? Rigatoni and zucchini mixed with asparagus, risotto cheese, and a zesty spring onion. If you like what you hear and what you see, then stay tuned. Meals from the field when the Farm Monitor continues. The University of Georgia is home to a world-renowned cutting-edge plant breeding program, the Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics, and Genomics. Plant breeding is the science of selecting a plant's desirable genetic traits to develop new varieties of field crops, vegetables, fruits, and ornamentals. When combined with the latest advancements in genetics and genomics, this critical science is significantly advancing the field of plant production. The Institute, known widely as IPBGG, is home to an interdisciplinary group of faculty at the forefront of plant breeding and genetics research. 
we are responding to the need to feed the world's growing population by producing healthy plant varieties and improving crop yields. We are addressing the pressures of climate change by developing the latest technologies to grow crops with limited space and resources. We are innovating to produce plant varieties that are more resistant to pests, pathogens, drought, and climate variability. And we are mentoring IPBGG graduate students to be top competitors in the job market, ready to become leaders in their field and improve our world. Our graduate students have access to diverse graduate level courses, gaining knowledge and hands-on experience in modern plant breeding, genetics, and genomics. Thanks to Georgia's diverse soil and climate conditions, our students are exposed to a wide variety of crops, making ours one of the most diverse plant breeding and genetics programs in the world. Encompassing three campuses, Athens, Griffin, and Tifton, Georgia, and housed at a land-grant university, we give students the opportunity to work in a variety of state-of-the-art lab and field research facilities across the state our students can fully immerse themselves in the many vibrant and diverse research environments housed within the IPBGG. There are also a variety of professional development opportunities available for students to hone their outreach skills. And while our reach is wide, our community is tight-knit. The quality of student life at the University of Georgia is unparalleled. The Institute of Plant Breeding, Genetics, and Genomics brings together a diverse group of people united towards a common goal. Join us as we commit to improving plants for the health of our planet. Well, the countdown continues. April 17th, the official pack date for Vidalia onions here in Georgia. And today we are celebrating the occasion, actually getting you ready, a little bit of a preview of a Vidalia onion season by doing a couple of recipes using a variation of a Vidalia onion, still an official Vidalia onion, but they are spring, well, I shouldn't say official uh, Vidalia onion, but they are a variation of a Vidalia onion. These are spring onions that are actually called like baby Vidalias or something right, like so that. Right, so these are little bows, petite, sweet Vidalia onions. So you see you get the bulb, plus you get these nice green fronds to go with it. So it's a cool. you can get them in the spring. Um, so the recipes that I'm doing today, we're using these spring onions because they're available in your grocery store right now. Mm -hmm. Once the pack date hits, we won't be able to get these. So if you want to make these dishes, in a time other than spring, you can use scallions, you can use yellow onions, sweet onions, whatever you want to use. All right, the voice of reason, Dr. Tracy Brigman, of course, registered dietitian, uh, many, many titles here at UGA. I'm gonna put this back because okay. I stole this from you back yes. here. Yeah. Um, and I don't want Rob, your assistant, to get mad at me, so we're gonna put that back there. But yeah, so what, let's go ahead and uh, let's hit that number one recipe. What yeah. do we got for us? So we're gonna do a spring onion asparagus risotto. Okay. So a lot of people shy away from risotto, but it's actually pretty easy. So what I have here, I took two cups of the white part of that spring onion and I have sauteed it in one tablespoon of olive oil for about seven minutes. You can see it's kind of browned, um, it's translucent, it's softened, so I want to start with that. So um, after that's cooked and translucent, I'm going to add one cup of arborio rice. Mm -hmm. It does need to be arborio rice. Arborio rice is a short grain rice. Um, so it's going to cook different than a long grain rice. It's meant to be sticky. Okay. Um, and unlike regular rice, when you make long grain rice for a side dish, you want it to be nice and fluffy. And you normally put it in and you don't touch it. Mm -hmm. This I'm going to stir quite frequently because I want to release some of those starches to get a little bit sticky. All right. So once I have my rice and my onions mixed up, well combined, I'm going to start adding my chicken broth. So I have four cups of chicken broth here. You can make it from bouillon. I just bought the packaged kind. Um, 
I don't normally measure liquids in a dry measuring cup, but I don't have to be exact with this one. Okay. So I'm gonna add one half cup to three quarter cups of liquid at a time. So again, I can just estimate, which is why I'm not using a liquid measuring cup. I'm gonna pour this in to my mixture. I'm gonna stir it around a little bit, and then I'm gonna let it sit. I'm gonna stir it maybe every 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to stick to the bottom, so I want a medium bubble, so medium low. And I will watch it until the liquid that I poured in is absorbed. Mm -hmm. Once it's absorbed, I'm gonna go in with Eyeballing it again? Eyeballing it again. You know what Another. the kids today call that, right? They what? call it freestyling. Oh, okay, I'm freestyling. Yes. I'm cool. Um, <laughs> I'm in. So, again, once all of the liquid is soaked up, then I'm going to put in another half cup to three quarter cup, stir it a little bit, leave it alone for a little bit, mm -hmm. continue that until I get to my last one half cup to three quarter cup. Okay. So, with this last addition of my chicken broth, then I want to add my asparagus. Asparagus. Yum. And my green onion tops. Green or onion my tops. spring onion tops. Spring onion tops. And then the, whoops, the shaved cheese. Parm. Parm. Okay. And I just make sure that gets mixed in evenly as I spray green onion tops That's everywhere. That's right, we'll put it back in there. That's right, because this is clean. And once I get it all mixed in really well, combined, I have my spring onion asparagus risotto. If you don't like asparagus, you could do some other green in there. Now, if you thought that recipe was easy, where do you see this one? This one is super easy. <laughs> this is a spring onion and zucchini rigatoni, so it's a nice, light, I feel like springtime we eat lighter. Sure. Um, so it's a nice light recipe, super easy. Um, so I'm gonna start with three tablespoons of olive oil. After I put in my three tablespoons of olive oil, I need three garlic cloves minced. Yes, you may put that in now. All right, there we go. I'm gonna heat this over medium high heat. Mm -hmm. I also want my red pepper flake in here. Okay. So I can, I can either use all of it or just a pinch, it's kind of what you, it's it's half of a teaspoon. So if you want some heat, use the whole thing. If you're not a heat person. You know, we did this last month, you and I. I so know. what do you want? Do you want a pinch or do you want the whole thing? I like the whole thing. <laughs> okay, let's go for the whole thing. Can now? Yeah. Okay. Now. Yep. So, <laughs> Beth's gonna give you the option. <laughs> um, I'm gonna heat this on medium high heat until it's fragrance, fragrant so that you can kind of smell the garlic and the red pepper flakes, about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Once I have that done, I have one cup. You're closer. <laughs> I have one cup of thinly sliced spring onion. So you'll see in this one cup that both the green top and the white bulb is in here. So I want a good mixture of that spring onion. So once these are sauteed for about two minutes, this is three and a half cups of zucchini that have been halved and sliced thinly. All right. So I'm gonna add that in. There you go. Give it a little stir. The, these are going to cook for about three to four minutes. I want them slightly cooked. I wanna make sure I don't overcook them because if I do, they'll turn to mush. So my zucchini has cooked for about three to four minutes. So you see it's, it's slightly cooked. It has not turned to mush. And then we're just gonna finish this dish off. This is a quarter cup of half and half. I'm gonna mix that in. Once I have my half and half mixed in, I'm gonna add some cooked pasta. So once I get all of this mixed in, I'm going to top it. This is Pecorino Romano cheese and you can add as little or as much once you stir in all the cheese. You are good to go with your spring onion and zucchini rigatoni, a nice light spring meal. Two easy, simple recipes to get you ready for Vidalia onion season. You can find them by logging on to farm-monitor.com, going to the recipe section, 
Um, again, the recipes just continue to pile up. Uh, we've got so many, and I've lost count. Uh, but again, you can just go on that search bar in there. You can type in any kind of recipe you want, onions, if you want to use beef or whatever. So, uh, but yeah, again, and Tracy, thank you so much as always. Looking forward to Vidalia onion season. Um, thank you for watching and we shall see you next month. You heard Ray mention our website. Don't forget to join us on the Farm Monitor Facebook page as well. We've got exclusive behind-the-scenes photos, the most updated stories, and interactive content. You can even suggest story ideas. So like the Farm Monitor Facebook page today and be part of our growing family of agriculture enthusiasts. Up next, the initiative taking root across America, how the collaborative effort between American Farm Bureau and Young Farmers is tackling food insecurity head on. So the Harvest for All initiative is something that the American Farm Bureau Federation started in collaboration to help address the food insecurity issue plaguing this nation. We don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're looking for it, but it is there. And so the Harvest for All campaign is just an initiative to really put the boots to the ground um, and provide that community service outreach to those that are desperately in, in need of it. Harvest for All is such a, a great opportunity for young farmers across this country to work with their state farm bureaus as well as American Farm Bureau to, to really give back to the people that really need that food. I come from the state of Florida and we have a lot of vegetable producers and citrus producers that have extra produce uh, that just needs to be given to people in need. To see it over the last 22 years that's donated close to 400 million pounds of food, it's just an incredible experience and something that I hope continues on for the next 20 years. So giving back is so important because it takes a community to come together to make sure those who are in need have the resources. And a lot of times, you know, it doesn't take much. If you bring a few cans of food or some clothing, when you pool all of your resources together, we can make a pretty big impact. And so what we're doing as far as Harvest for All goes, we are donating you know, pounds of food, man hours, and as well as dollars donated just to try to give back to our communities, both at the local, state, and the national level as well. What's really neat about what we've been able to do from a grassroots level, our county level, our state level, our national level, we've been able to overall, after 22 years, we've been able to donate over 408 million pounds of food nearly 230,000 volunteer hours. And to be able to do that across the nation has been such an impact through 2023 and 2024. Something that's really exciting about Harvest for All is historically it's just been a partnership with local food pantries and charitable food organizations. But a really exciting thing is that the program has been expanded into general charitable organizations because we know young farmer and ranchers across the country are making all kinds of great donations, whether it's their time or money to things like disaster relief, all other kinds of organizations and charitable needs that there are. To get back to what farmers do for a living, and I really think it's what we were put on this earth to do, was to feed people. And it's a great day when not only young farmers, but farmers can go out and see the food that they've worked so hard to produce and be placed in the hands of people that need it. It's an incredible experience and it really makes my heart filled with joy to be able to do that. Harvest for All is so important because it's a collaborative program between AFBF Young Farmers and Ranchers on the state, national, and county level. And it's important because, you know, farmers feed the world. And this is a different kind of helping, but it's so necessary because, you know, not everyone can just go out and buy a whole bunch of groceries. And so that's what Harvest for All is all about. Like, no matter whether it's your time, money, or food, you're helping out people in need. Great cause, that's for sure. Our thanks to American Farm Bureau for that, but more importantly, thanks to all of you for making this show possible. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe. Hope you have a great week.